Greetings and salutations, travelers of the internet. Welcome to the Lit Roundtable. I'm Anna. And I'm Joseph, and we'll be your wise or not so wise mentors for today's audio adventure into all things storytelling. Woohoo! Episode, episode 15! Thank you. I was about to say the same thing. Lovely. It's a episode good number. 15. It is mm-hmm. a good number. What are we talking about today, Joseph? I like numbers divisible by three. Anyway. Hmm, um, I like numbers divisible five. by five. Yeah. Even more. Five is even So 15 honest. is a, 15's a good one because it's got it's both. Both. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Did you know we're a math podcast now? <laughs> but only mm. as long as we're talking about simple multiplication and division. And even then. <laughs> Only numbers divisible by five. <laughs> uh, anyway, so today's topic, we're going to dive into a specific trope. Um, and that is the trope of having an evil fantasy race mm. in a story. A, a race that is irredeemable, completely evil mm-hmm. um, in, in, in fiction. So mm-hmm. specifically fantasy, some sci-fi too, but we're going to yeah. focus mostly on fantasy. Sure. Um just because, you know, that's our bread and butter over here at the Lit Round Table. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Before we do that, I, I have know. a very silly <laughs> question I want to ask you. Yes. So, um, I was scrolling on TikTok, and I saw a video from Elise Myers and Jonas Myers. Jonas is a, a Nebraska native, so they live in, they live in Omaha. But, um, and if you've seen Elise on TikTok, I'm sure you love her, because she's wonderful. But... They had a video where Elise was asking Jonas how he eats Skittles or Starbursts. So I want to start with Skittles and ask Joseph, how do you eat Skittles? Do you do like handfuls or individual? No, that's barbaric. So So let me answer the Starburst one first. Because with Starbursts, it's pretty much whatever order they are in the tube. I just eat them one at a time. I'm not going to detube all of them and sort them. That's too much effort. Skittles though. And I appreciate that answer. Yeah. You just, you're eating those things one at a time. And if you get like a bunch in a row that are the same color, bummer, Mm -hmm. but that's fate. (laughs) Um, Don't mess with fate. (laughs) With Skittles though, it's, one at a time or two at a time if they're the same color. Okay. So I you never rarely, mix colors. Rarely will I mix colors. I, I'm in an especially chaotic mood if I'm just throwing a whole handful of Skittles in my mouth. Yeah. You know when the green ones used to be lime and not green apple? Um, Lemon lime together. I would do that. How but now they're green apple. That? No. I don't know, when I was a kid. Well, yeah. I swear, they were lime. I believe you. I mean, I, I don't know. I don't know, the, or, I don't know enough Skittles lore. To... I mean, maybe I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, so if, if I just have like a bag of Skittles, like a standard bag of Skittles you'd get in like the grocery store checkout. Mm-hmm. I mean, in an ideal situation, I dump them all out. <laughs> You sort them. And I colorize them. Like I sort them by rainbow. Oh, and then okay. I'll and then I'll eat the one that has the most first until it's so I'm basically gonna eat them until they're down to one left of each color. Gotcha. And then I will go like one at a time, each color of the rainbow at the end. Interesting. So Skittles, the colors have different flavors. Yeah. But what about M and M's? M and M's, it's a free for all, man. I yeah, I will just go happens, handfuls happens. of M and M's <laughs> with reckless okay. abandon because they're not different okay. flavors. Yeah, yeah. It's different. So, um, we're pretty much the same. I don't know that I, um, like there may be occasion where I would combine flavors and Skittles, but it'd only be like one in one. Like I might do like a red one and a pink one just yeah. to see what would happen. Mm-hmm. <laughs> But never like a full handful. That's just crazy. It's too um, much. If it's like a little like Halloween sized fun bag of, of Skittles. Mm-mm, not even then. 
see, but but with then with those, I'm not confident I could even complete the rainbow with just the fun sized ones. I don't know if they would have all the colors in it. If I look in there and it's like mostly purple, I'm just going to mm. down it because I can't do my thing and I'm just going to eat it all and try to forget that it's oh. not perfect. <laughs> Interesting. Okay. Interesting. But well, in a perfect world, I sort them. For the record, we're on Elise Meyer's side. Jonas is a is a Skittle fiend and will go by the fistful. Well, she needs to cut Jonas out of her life. <laughs> No, 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 no. <laughs> this is not true. We do not support that. They're adorable, but he is um he's got the wrong idea on how to eat Skittles. And he's then he said, he said that if Starbursts were unwrapped, he'd do the same thing with Starbursts. And I was like, no, you're so wrong. <laughs> he's on an FBI list, dude. Like, he's a menace to society. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> no. <Ugh>. Yikes. <laughs> Anyway, I thought it was funny, and I was curious to to hear where you were at on that. Yes, Especially for sure. Too. For sure. Mm. Cool. Well, maybe we'll start another podcast just about how we eat candy. <laughs> One candy at a time. <laughs> Joseph, how do you eat Whoppers? I don't. Whoppers are gross. Um, I suck on them until the chocolate has been breached, and then... Like, there's a hole in the chocolate, and you can get to the malt part of the Whopper... Okay. And then I continue to suck on it until the whopper, like the malt part, is gone, and then I chew up whatever's left. Like I, like I suck all of the air out of them. I just don't like malt powder. It's I not love a fan. Malt powder. I love not it. a fan. Not a fan. But it's okay that you like it. That's okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um. Anyway, moving <laughs> on from candy. So we're gonna talk about. <laughs> Similarly to how Jonas is a menace to society, mm, in mm-hmm. some of these stories, these fantasy races are a menace to society. Mm, so, mm-hmm. so okay, so let me explain <laughs> what I mean by this. I'm talking like in Lord of the Rings, we've got orcs. Mm-hmm. You know, in Star Wars, we've got like battle droids, um, which it are counts. Are they a race? I'm counting it because it oh, comes. Okay. it'll come into play later on in my spiel. Game of Thrones, we have White Walkers. Mm -hmm. And Dungeons and Dragons, a lot of they have a whole alignment system where certain races like are aligned a certain way. Like black Mm -hmm. dragons are all chaotic evil. Um Mm -hmm. red dragons are all lawful evil. Um so they've got these these alignment charts where they kind of uh narrow an entire group in on one alignment um for some of the the bad guys anyway wheel of time has the okay. trollocs um mm-hmm. so there's there's a lot of this in fantasy where there's there's a race of creatures that is a, a, a sentient race pretty much that is evil and this is why i argue the battle droids but i'm curious to hear your spiel so keep going Clones, then. <laughs> okay. Um, the uh, the clones. So the the thing about this is that it's kind of become a controversial thing that it kind of gives people the ick. You know, they don't like an entire race of of beings, uh, an entire sentient race of beings, being kind of black and white categorized as wholly good or wholly evil. Um, a lot of people don't like that trope nowadays Mm -hmm. but um you see it you see it all the time so Mm -hmm. like what what is i'm just curious what is your opinion on this trope and um what purpose do you think it serves Ooh, okay um since you're since you're a writer yeah i'm curious to see how you're going to respond to this But, um, historically for myself, um, I've been, I've like gotten, I don't know if annoyed is the right word, but like kind of brushed it off and people have said things like, oh, well, it's wrong to have whole races of beings be the bad guys. Mm. Um, mostly because that's so common and just what I'm used to reading. Yeah. Um, and it, 
in t- at times in my past, I felt myself like bristle against the idea of like the the current um, trope of humanizing bad mm-hmm. guys mm-hmm. Um, and giving them backstories and making them um, sympathetic. It's almost like it's a trope and then an anti trope, you know, where right. the anti trope has become a trope. Right. Um, so I've, I've felt myself bristle against that in the past. That being said, um, I do think that there's a historical reason why that happens. And I think that's because we come from like our history and mythos is centered a lot around nations warring. And so like the orcs are a nation, not necessarily a race. And like that's been misconstrued over time to become like a race of people instead of a nation of people. Um, just like, I mean, there are other examples in Tolkien where it's like this country is warring against this country. Um, and doesn't necessarily have to do with the race of those people. So I think that that's why it happens because we have a history of that, like a world history of that. Um, but my current like stance is more of the, yeah, it's not a great idea to just demonize whole groups of people because it's very um, short-sighted. Mm. And that's not to say that um, large groups of people can be very wrong about something. Like, I will vehemently state that uh, the Nazis were a problem. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. yeah, bad guys. <laughs> yeah. Um, but... I think that in fiction, I think it's an opportunity for us to see the humanity in other people. And so I think that um, this kind of trend moving away from having whole groups be evil um, and maybe giving them some more relatable human traits and humanity mm-hmm. is a good thing. Mm-hmm. And um, in my one of my classes last semester, we talked, or I, I guess my one of my projects was looking for diversity in fantasy um, and YA fantasy. And so I have a book that I have not read all of, but I've started to read called The Dark... um, uh, I'll have it in the description, but I think it's called The Dark Fantastic. Um, And so talking about, like, how a lot of times when we see this kind of, like, race issue in fantasy, it's, like, black and white... But also, like, racially black and white. Mm-hmm. Um, and how that's a problem, which, of course, it is. Um, but, like, it doesn't feel like that's the problem until you start yeah. looking at it and being like, oh, yeah, this is a common thing where it's black people are the bad guys or people of color, not necessarily mm-hmm. black. But yeah. um, anyway, was that what you were expecting? Sure. <laughs> Okay. I was well. I just I was just curious on what your overall like, your general thoughts were on the trope, and you I think answered that, that it's. I think that it's ever evolving. Like I yeah. feel like I'm growing, mm-hmm. and in growing and like learning to listen more to like the perspective that it, it, it. I mean, like you can have bad guys. Oh yeah. Like bad to the bone, bad guys, um, but don't make it because. Of their race. Yeah. Like have it be a different factor. Like not just because it's a black dragon. Um, Mm -hmm. You know. Or they're a goblin. Right. Right. Um, So I know that something that people talk about a lot is that one of the reasons why these franchises or these these stories have these um, bad guys that are bad to the core is because mm-hmm. it gives it gives the protagonist enemies that they can use as punching bags mm-hmm. guiltlessly. So sure. so you've you've got um situations where the protagonist cuts down like thirty plus goblins, you know, mm-hmm. in a fight and you don't feel bad. Um, you don't right. you don't feel any remorse whatsoever for the goblins because it's an evil race of creatures that just pillage and destroy. Um, so it's mm-hmm. just an ex- it's just an excuse. And you, we could we could dive into the psychology of why 
we want that in a story. Um, we want why we would want a protagonist that can uh, just go on a killing spree and kill all of these creatures guiltlessly and Mm -hmm. how that's kind of a weird um, self-insert. Like, you know what I'm trying to say? Yeah, yeah. I hadn't thought of it that way, but yeah. And how that's kind of a a problematic thought process, Mm -hmm. um, you know, of, of trying to like fulfill that fantasy of being able to just beat up a group of, of people or in a lot of cases, just kill a a group of people guiltlessly in, in your story. But one that I, um, one that I thought about while I was thinking about this topic was in the movies for Lord of the Rings, Mm -hmm. we never see Aragorn ever draw his sword or raise a sword against another human. Oh. He only ever kills orcs. He fights ring wraiths. The closest that we get is when they take over the Corsair ships. But even then, he's not the one that shoots Peter Jackson's cameo. Okay, well, okay. And in the Golden Hall, he certainly fights with members of the Rohirrim. Without and it's a not sword. His, but that's not his that would not have been his choice. He doesn't have a sword. It's non-lethal. It's because we don't... they took it from him. I'm just, but I'm I just mean, saying. He, he might not have drawn his sword, but like, it's hard right. to know because he didn't have it with him. I'm not, I'm <laughs> not so much giving, I'm not so much saying that he wouldn't have in that situation. Mm-hmm. I'm more giving a, a commentary on like the storytelling decision hmm. of, of them choosing to never have Aragorn use any kind of seemingly lethal force against a human in the movies. He only ever kills, directly with his own hands, he only ever kills orcs. Interesting. Yeah, I was thinking, as you were saying that, I was like, well, they do the same with other characters, but that's not true, because Aemir threatens them. He chucks a spear and kills that Mumakil driver. Um, Yeah. And Faramir has his whole monologue about, you know, Mm -hmm. after he kills that Haradrim and it falls off the Oliphant, Mm -hmm. about, about how... Is he actually evil? Like, what lies led him to his long march far from home? See, that is one of the... That monologue that Faramir has, both in the book and in the movies, is one of the... um, uh, In my opinion, it's one of the saving graces for Tolkien in this conversation about race. Mm -hmm. Um, Because it he's showing that... Aside from the orcs, but Mm -hmm. but even like the trolls... The trolls and the Hobbit, like they're very human. Yeah, for sure. Um, and the goblins in the Hobbit are very like they're goblins, but they they have like families and conversations, and they're funny, and, and they music. have goals, and yeah, they're they're very human in that like, way. Like there's a goblin culture in the Misty Mountains, yeah. you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but you lose in the Lord of the Rings, um, in a lot of ways. Yeah. But um, interesting. But I, but I think that that, that quote from Faramir um, shows that Tolkien realized, and I think that's coming from his own experience with war and being a soldier, that you're, you're not fighting a faceless enemy. Mm-hmm. Like, these are people, too, with homes and families, um, which I think lends credence to, to The Lord of the Rings as a yeah. series, in my opinion. Yeah. And that's, Once again, showing my my Tolkien yeah. affinity. And I'm specifically <laughs> talking about the movies. I'm sure, like in mm-hmm. the books, that's not the case. I'm sure he probably kills people in the books. Well, I'm thinking, um, like the Battle of Pelennor Fields. It seems incredibly yeah. unlikely that by the time he gets there, that there aren't any Haradrim or Easterlings yeah. left. Um, it's just interesting to me that in the movies, even if like canonically he did, they didn't show it. He only ever kills orcs. And I feel like part of it is because Aragorn is supposed to be like the ideal king mm-hmm. of like mm-hmm. humanity. And they don't want to show him raising a sword to another human. Man, do you think that was intentional? Or I do you think, think so. that was just like happenstance? I think it was. I think I think it was in- I have a hard time with a lot of things I see in movies not seeing it as intentional. Like yeah. the amount of planning that goes into it. 
um, right. with like the staging and the writing. Like I have a hard time right. thinking that wasn't intentional. Um, and with Peter Jackson, like the level of care he took f- towards the Lord of the Rings movies, it, that's probably true. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Um, so that was just an interesting thing that I thought of. But yeah, this this idea that these these evil races of, of beings exist as basically cannon fodder for the heroes, mm. and then that we as readers don't feel guilty about it um, because they're they're irredeemably evil and they're just cannon fodder. Um, that's yeah. kind of the the role that the trope fulfills. Um, mm-hmm. But like we've discussed, some people kick back against that and say that's kind of messed up to have a whole race of irredeemably evil creatures or beings. Mm-hmm. That's that's kind of messed up to to make well, them all like that. Yeah, and that that really um, that's interesting because depending on your worldview. Is anyone beyond redemption? Right. It's 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 interesting to think about like the psychology behind mm-hmm. those decisions to make stories like that. Mm-hmm. Um, it is really interesting to think about what the worldview was of the creator of that story. Um, right. But also, I would argue that there are ways to pull it off. Okay. To make it okay in my mind, anyway, and this is all my opinion. So like, so is this where the battle droids come into play? Right, like, <laughs> like okay, battle droids okay. are one artificial intelligence. They're robots. They don't feel pain, probably. Um, I like I I have never felt sad really about a battle droid getting cut in half. Uh, right. Um, it's just okay. it's it's a light show with it's it's got a he got cut in half with a giant glow stick. I mean, I'm not I don't feel bad about this. Um, okay, that's really interesting because in the original Star Wars movies, of course, they were stormtroopers, mm-hmm. which are not in by that point they're not even clones anymore. Um, yeah. So it's an interesting choice that going backwards, George Lucas chose to have it be droid so that we wouldn't feel bad about the Jedi destroying mm-hmm. this because, group of creatures yep, droids yep and once interesting and one, like they're oh. just the droids are cannon fodder and they're the perfect cannon fodder because we mm-hmm. don't there's really they were manufactured they were just created you can't mm-hmm. really you can't really feel ethically bad for the droids and like really you're destroying a, someone's property yeah in the grand scheme of things <laughs> yeah not a life yeah. It's it's certainly honestly, here's my Star Wars hot take. The okay. separate the separatists creating battle droids to fight the war for them was highly more ethical of them than than cloning someone and forcing their clones to fight the war. Um yeah. because the clones are like people that feel pain and they're just a replica of a real person. So, like, the Separatists were far more ethical in the prequels than the Republic was. So, that's my hot take. No, I completely agree. Um, Yeah, because when you're talking about what life are you willing to sacrifice, um, and the Separatists said, not ours. Yeah. (laughs) It's basically like, Mm -hmm. like... If, you know, how real world humanity would evolve with like drone warfare, it's just, yeah. just a bunch of robots fighting each other, like the robot wars. That's, yeah. you know. I mean, unfortunately, in the real world, even with the drone warfare, like there are still casualties of. Yeah, because who are the drones targeting? People. Right. Um, um, which is the same in Star Wars, like who are the battle droids targeting? Right. Right. Um, so. In my mind, that's a way to make it okay. Okay. If they're robots. I can get behind that. Another way I think you can make it okay, at least in your world building. Um, I have a few things listed off. You're going to hate this one. But one, make them zombies. <laughs> yeah, that's um, fine. Because I mean, zombies, I hate zombies, but yeah, they're already dead, so... You feel bad, better. yeah, like, you feel bad because they're a dead person, like, they used right. to be a person, but you don't feel right. guilty anytime a zombie gets its head blown off, because no. it's, like, a reanimated corpse, either from the zombie virus or from, like, a necromancer casting some evil right. spell, you know? Which is, like, its own kind of violation against that person, right? Right. 
Yeah. Yeah. Um, so make them zombies. <laughs> uh, two, make them experiments. So like if if you have so like an experiment is kind of like the battle droid route where they're like created. If it's a fantasy setting, they're created magically to be these fighting killing machines to be obstacles for your protagonists or in so a like, sci-fi setting. That's like setting. the orcs. Like the orcs were created by Morgoth to Yeah, I mean depending on what version sure. Tolkien never actually sure. decided depending yeah. on what canon you you decide to go with on that or what theory. But yeah. <laughs> um there's also Oh, in a so in a sci-fi setting, that's what I was going to say. In a sci-fi setting, you can make it robots like with battle droids. Yeah. Um the replicators from Stargate. Mm, mm-hmm. Remember those little boogers? Yeah, the worst. Created by the Asgard. Them. A, a botched science experiment. And you yeah. don't feel guilty, even with the human looking replicators, you don't feel guilty. No. <laughs> they're nasty. Yeah. Nasty, nasty. But, okay, Stargate is a good point because the Ghoul, Goa'uld, have overtaken the Jaffa mm-hmm. and are like using them as incubators. Um, and then the Jaffa are liberated. And there's even a subsection of the Guauld who mm-hmm. defect from that and don't agree with that. I forget right. what they're called. Um, um, oh the, my gosh. The good guy Goulds that Captain Carter's dad joins to heal his brain cancer or whatever. Yeah. Um, that's going to drive me crazy. I'm not, I'm not going to remember it, so I'm going to move on. I'm not on, either, but... but it's going to drive me crazy. But, um, yeah, like, whether they're being parasitic or symbiotic right. is, like, the defining factor there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, another way that you can make it kind of okay is if it's a type of, like, mind control situation where a group is being compelled to do mm. a certain thing or to be antagonistic. Um if you can like mind control a group into doing something. Um, but how is mind control different from brainwashing? And if you've been brainwashed, are you redeemable? Like then kind of the main conflict of the story, I feel like is trying to stop the mind control from happening. Right. You know, right. Um, but you, you, you take the means necessary to protect yourself in the situations where the mind controlled individuals are trying to kill you. Um, gotcha. But yeah. that can be a way, because then it's like they're doing something against their will, and you don't mm-hmm. feel as, like, on a storytelling level, you don't feel like it's just a, oh, they made all these people bad guys. It's a, they're doing bad things because of a bad person forcing them to do bad things gotcha. against their will. Yeah, you know? yeah. I can get behind that. Um, the last thing that I had written down was, make it a plot twist. They aren't really evil. Like, <laughs> oh, okay. Um, you you can have you know maybe your your character your protagonist is a victim of like indoctrination or brainwashing to mm-hmm. think that a certain race is like all irredeemably evil, but then you have a moment where their bubble is suddenly burst, you know, oh, and they okay. their their mind is expanded and they <laughs> and they. Can you think of an example that already exists in fiction? Um. Let's see. Well, I mean, moments like what with Faramir and Sam and Frodo were, Mm -hmm. you know, moments like that. Um, Maybe um, Pocahontas. Maybe not that specifically. Well, okay. There's a good one. Um, I'm thinking maybe like there's an inferiority or superiority complex with like Spock and non-Vulcans. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It's not quite to that extreme, but I think that that is a dynamic that's explored. Yeah. In Star Trek. Yeah. Certainly. And he, like, hates the human side of himself sometimes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But he loves Spock Kirk. needs therapy. Spock oh, yeah. Therapy. <laughs> um, so, yeah, those are all ways in my mind that you can kind of still use the trope mm-hmm. in, a, in a good way that is satisfying, where you still get... Your, your hero still gets really cool fight scenes against, like, you know, the bad guys and can kind of use them as a punching bag and, and a, mm-hmm. a way to, like, show off their their skills, um, yeah. but in a way that doesn't feel icky. Like, how come think, this whole race is evil? 
Yeah. I think that Game of... You mentioned Game of Thrones at the beginning, and I think it's not a good example of this because... Specifically... Everyone is evil. Specifically, the White Walkers is, like, the yeah. only... Is, like, the only time in Game of Thrones when it's, when it's a thing. But again, they were a botched... According to the show, you know, I'm not a mm. book expert. <laughs> they were, like, a, a magical weapon created by the children of the forest to fight off men um, mm-hmm. that were, like, invading their land. So even that is right. kind of like a... They were a, a magic creation. That's just an example where it's a, it's a fantasy story with a race of bad guys that's, like, irredeemably bad. Yeah. Um, that you don't feel guilty about when they get killed. <laughs> right. So... Right. So Pocahontas is a good example of John Smith coming in with a very, like, set yeah. per- perception of, like... Mm-hmm. Native Americans, and then that mm-hmm. perception being challenged and, and burst. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, so. so then Avatar is also part of that. Correct. <laughs> that is correct. Okay. Because <laughs> okay. Avatar is book honest. Indeed it is. Um, so yeah. Um, there's there's probably other ways that I just didn't think of, of, of ways that it's been creatively used in a way that makes sense world building wise and isn't just Mm -hmm. this whole race is evil. Um, Right. So if there, if you think of any instances where this has happened and um, you liked the way the trope was used, um, let us know. Yeah. In the places, in the comments and whatnot. Sure. Or if you're. Expect a full dissertation. Right. I mean, because I mean, some (laughs) people still like the, the trope obviously because it's like, um, it gives, because we've talked before about how we like villains that are clearly villains. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's what you get with that trope, right? right you don't you right. don't have to ask the question of like, is this a good guy or a bad guy? No, he's wearing that shirt. <laughs> I'm gonna kill him. So like, there's yeah. there's a simplicity to it that I think is appealing. Um, sure. But I think there is also well, a side of it, like we discussed, that can be, you know. Yeah. Iffy. Well, I think um, another interesting thing to consider is worldview and this concept of like good guys versus bad guys. Mm-hmm. Um, and by worldview, I mean like your religious background and um, like how you view the world. I think that if you come from a particularly religious background, um, and I'll specifically say Christian because not all religions are the same. I think that the concept of having good versus evil uh-huh. feels true uh-huh. um, because you're used to hearing like the Satan versus God story. Yeah. Yeah. And you're looking for that to be mirrored in your story that you're ingesting, uh-huh. which is, which is part of mythology guys. And Just newsflash say. Tolkien was a devout Catholic. <laughs> right. So that makes sense. <laughs> It makes yeah. sense. Um, but just, like, when you're looking at the, um, like, the way we tell story and the way stories have developed over time and they come out of mythology and, like, you know, like, the earliest stories recorded are, like, how did we come to be the way we are? Yeah. Um, and, like, following that story and that that line of thinking, it makes sense that we would come to this kind of trope. For sure. Yeah. Um, And I think that as we're growing as a society and as people, it makes sense that we're kind of starting to push back against that and see, like, how can we make a more nuanced story that's maybe more complete and more Mm -hmm. um, true. And because having a story that's just good versus evil is Mm -hmm. very, like, this team versus this team, black and white. Very binary. It's it's very binary. It's very divisive. Mm -hmm. Um. I mean, look at the modern political landscape. Um, the, right. the the us versus them mentality. Right. Um, and in reality, there's so much gray. There's a lot of nuance. Yeah. A lot of complexity. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, I totally see what you mean about how worldview and upbringing impacts the kind of stories that you tell, that you ingest. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Absolutely. But. Yeah, and I think I agree that it, it makes sense that that trope came up. Um, it makes total sense, and yeah. it makes sense why, at this point, some people are kind of 
not completely rejecting, but just kind of like trying to alter it to make it better. Challenging it. Yeah. 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 To make a better story. For sure. Like that's all we can ever hope for, right? It's just to tell a better story. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's our talk about evil fantasy races. <laughs> and speaking of... Um, you know, we got a little more philosophical than I was expecting. Sorry. Yeah, before man. Before you segued us into the next thing. Um, but that's a good, good combo. Yeah. So thanks for picking that topic. Yeah, man. Um, you're welcome. Segway. So. Segway now. So, <laughs> uh, speaking of stories that we like to, uh, that we like to ingest, mm -hmm. I, I keep saying that stories that we ingest and it sounds like I'm eating it. Oh it's, yeah, man. <laughs> book eaters. Um, that's a thing. Nom, nom, nom. I should look into it. Yeah. Uh, not like actually eating books. I mean, that term is a thing. Yes. Anyway. If you're actually eating books, you should see a doctor. You have right. some kind you of... You probably need some fiber in your diet. Your body is craving something. It's not actually books. <laughs> it's not actually paper. <laughs> so, um, let's get into our... What are we watching, reading, playing? All that good stuff. Of course, we are still supporting SAG-AFTRA and the WGA, so... Right. Um, but, right after we recorded that episode, we did have some like good news come out of dropout that they were um that they had negotiated and they were no longer on strike like nice that, that dropout specifically so dimension 20 and those guys are back in production which is great lovely so i know when we recorded our episode there was some dispute and anyway yeah well so i think it's like the next day that came out that sam Reich was like oh we're we're back in business we're back baby nice yeah <laughs> well would you like to start us off with sure. your stuff. Sure. Um, so for reading, A Magic Steeped in Poison by Judy Island. That's our mm. read-along book. You guys, it's getting real good. Mm -hmm. So if you haven't gotten in on that, you should. Um, also, just finished Show Me a Sign by... Um, I have it right here. By Anne Claire Lazat, which I've already read once this year, but I read it again for book club with my kiddos, and it was so good. We finished that today. Um, also reading um, Nimona by N.D. Stevenson, um, which has been really fun. I have a ton of books out from the library that I forgot about, so I will be reading those. <laughs> um, but I think that... Oh, I finished Cloud Atlas, mm, um, mm -hmm. which I read with my boyfriend, which was super fun and exciting to like have that little mini book club. So... Anyway, so we finished Cloud Atlas. It's very good. Mm -hmm. um, very mind bendy. Ooh. Okay. So if you're looking for something mind bendy, highly what, recommend. What genre would you say that is? I would, I would squarely place it in speculative fiction. Oh, okay, okay. Because it, um, it's like set in a world like ours. But it, it takes it like some a, very different turns. Like a dystopian like, future type thing? Some Part of it is, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, it's good. Would recommend. The audiobook is fun. Uh, it's a little... Okay, the audiobook is fun. I'm not rescinding that. Okay. But I think that there are parts that would have been easier for me to digest if I was reading it. With okay. With my eyeballs. Okay. Instead of just my ears. Um, and there's a movie. Mm -hmm. That's all I'm going to say about that for now. <laughs> all right. Um, <laughs> sag, and, sag. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Sag. Um. <laughs> um, let's see what else. Oh, I started listening to The Hobbit, um, read by Andy Serkis. Lovely. Yes, that's our next, um, we're reading that together now, um, which is my pick. And... Oh my gosh, the Andy Circus narration is so good. But you guys, I think I've been saying two of the dwarves' names wrong. Who? Forever. Oin and Gloin. How does he say it? Owen and Glowin. Nah, I think he's wrong. <laughs> you think he's wrong? I've always read it Oin and Gloin, like coin. That's the way they had it. They had, they had Owen and Gloin in the movies. Did they? Okay. Maybe it's like a regional I mean, thing. They're they're like they're 
they're fantasy names, whatever. You can say them however you want. But I was so, I was like, he keeps saying Owen and Glowen. Who is Owen? <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. It was really disconcerting, but um, that's those are the two that have like jumped out at me as being wildly different from how I have been saying them. Interesting. I'm gonna have to uh, get the Silmarillion because he did. did that too, and I'm gonna be super yeah. curious to see how he pronounces all those names. <laughs> yeah. Um, once I finish the Hobbit, I am going to try listening to the Silmarillion. Yes. So, yeah. That's the sole purpose of all of my rants for the bonus episodes is to get you to want to read the Silmarillion. <laughs> It's working. It's working. Lovely. It's working on a boyfriend too. So good job. Yes. Um, <laughs> anyway, continue. Um, and then for watching, um, lots of stuff I can't talk about, but um, Dimension 20, I started Metopolis, which is the new season. Oh, the one with Hank Green? Yes. Um, the first episode left me kind of like meh. But mm. we'll see how the second... By the end of it, I felt more engaged, so we'll see mm-hmm. how the second episode goes. I haven't watched it yet. Um, Critical Role Campaign 3, I'm all caught up. Mm. That was really fun. Um, gosh, is that the only thing I can... Are those the only things I can talk about? Anime. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Anime. <laughs> um, we're also watching Tokyo Ghoul. Yes. Um, for anime, which has been really fun. So much angst. It's so much angst. But you know what? I, there's something about this one that is is really just like hitting the anime spot for me. Yeah. It's a classic. Yeah. It's good. It's really good. It doesn't leave me feeling icky like some of the other ones. Give it time. Uh, <laughs> it's never, it, it can't be like banana fish. You're right. Yeah, I don't think it would ever get to that level, but it has its moments. No. Uh, no, I'm it, I'm not saying that it's not dark because it definitely is dark. Um, I'm saying it's it gets not dark. like I'm saying it gets darker. <laughs> oh really? Okay. Okay. Well, anyway, uh, I'm enjoying it so far. Good. I'm glad. Me too. Rewatch um, is good. Yeah, I think that's all I could talk about. Okay. But just you wait, you guys. We've got lists going. Are you still playing the oh, the yes. Ori game on I Switch? Am. I hadn't played it for a while, and I picked it up recently again. and was like, oh, yeah, this is where I was at. Because I got kind of stuck. Mm-hmm. Sometimes I get stuck. And then I have to, like, walk away from it to, like, regain perspective on what I'm sure. supposed to be doing. Come back with but fresh eyes. Exactly. Exactly. Cool. What about you? So, watching, of course, you just said Tokyo Ghoul, which was my pick for Anime Night. So I have yes. actually seen it before. Um, oh, I didn't know you'd seen the whole thing before. Correct. I have. Oh, okay. Um, Critical Role, Campaign 3. Mm -hmm. Um, I have also been watching, oh, I forgot to mention with anime, still watching One Piece. Oh, yeah. I'm only going to mention it, like, when I make progress, when I, like, watch more of it, because if I just... Fair. It'll be on my list for years. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Uh, So I did watch some more One Piece. Um, Also, I started watching another D&D stream um, called Once Upon a Witch Light... And it's the YouTube channel is called Legends of Avantris. My, I couldn't read my own handwriting, y'all. Okay. Uh, I had seen a ton of clips on TikTok about this stream where, like, there's this Chuckles the Clown character that keeps coming up and doing stupid stuff. Okay. Okay. Um, and it's just hilarious. It's so funny. These guys are so funny. It's DM'd by a lady, though, which is cool. Um, I don't know any of their names yet because I have only just started watching the stream, so sorry. Yeah. I know the character names. It's okay. <laughs> Dude, it took me forever to figure out the names of the actors on Critical Role. Yeah. yeah. Like, I had no clue who anybody was mm-hmm. for a long time. Um, and that's all I can say for watching. <laughs> and that's sag, okay. Sag, 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 sag. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sag after us, sag after us. Um, WGA, WGA. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, for reading A Magic Steep in Poison, for mm-hmm. a read-along, um, let's see, I'm still going through Nine Eyes of Lucian. Um, oh, yeah, that was the other one I was going to add to my list. Oh, yes. That I need to read. Mm-hmm. I am, I just today finished volume three of 
saga, wow. that comic. You're making progress. It's really dope. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, it's so dope that you think I should re-approach it? I think you would also enjoy it. I, th- I think I didn't know what to expect going in. It's very mm-hmm. adult, but it is just so off the chain and like just so many, it's just bonkers. Like okay. the robots have TVs for heads. There's mm-hmm. a spaceship forest where they find a forest where wooden rocket ships grow. And weird. they go to space in a wooden rocket ship. Like it's no, like there's it's that level of weird. Um, okay. But it's so so good. Um, so that's been fun. I also started reading Shadow of What Was Lost, which is a fantasy book. It's a trilogy, and this is the mm-hmm. first one. Um, mm-hmm. I had seen. Who's the author? Um, I'd have to look it up. I didn't write it down. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. But. Um, Shadow of What Was Lost? Shadow of What Was Lost is the title. Okay. Um, and that's, I'm only like a chapter in, but it's good so far. Nice. It's good. Um, How did you pick it up? I have always liked the way the cover looked, and I saw okay. it on a list of like recommended, if you like Wheel of Time, if you like um, that kind of high fantasy, it was recommended. Mm-hmm. So. Okay. Cool. Cool. Yeah. And I finished The Promised Neverland. <gasps> like finish, finished? Finished. Nice. So now you can watch the show. Now I can watch the show. And then tell me how different they are. And tell you how bad it is. In the second season. <laughs> the first season I think is pretty good. The fir- I've heard the first season is really faithful to the works. And it's not that the episode. second season isn't good. It's just very different. Yeah. But uh, it was very good. I am, so like, I know there's a word for it, and I keep thinking I'll remember it, but I never can. That kind of melancholy, mm. that that when you finish a series and you have that like melancholy of just like, you're, you're not going to get any new content with those characters, you know? Yeah. It's like you're yeah. saying goodbye to a friend, you know, or a yeah. group of friends, and they're just going to go off and live their life, and you don't get to know how the rest of it goes, yeah. and it's sad. Yeah. Yeah. But... It was very, very good. Good. Very satisfying ending. Wonderful. Um, so I'd highly recommend that. Okay. Um, for playing Tears of the Kingdom, I beat the story. <gasps> nice. I well have done. defeated Matt Mercer. <laughs> <laughs> and now I can just go and run around and dink around and do whatever I want. So, but yeah. I wanted to, I had enough hearts to do it, I thought, which I did. <laughs> And I was like, you know what? I'm just going to go beat it. And then I can see how the story ends. And then I can go back and finish the rest of the stuff. Yeah. Um, But I I needed to beat the story because Baldur's Gate 3 comes out soon. And that game is going to consume my life. Is it Um, not already out? It is out on Steam. But it doesn't come out on PS5. I won't, since we we pre-ordered it. So we'll have a few days early access. But we, I think it's September 2nd where Mm. we'll actually be able to play it on PS5. Okay. And That's I'm up. so stoked. Yeah, it looks super fun. I'm very excited about that. Interesting. Uh, but yeah, also D&D. Um, we've had two encounters now where we 100% should have died. All of us. All dead. Is the dragon egg still yes. surviving? Miraculously. Miraculously. Um, I didn't say, I don't think I said this on the podcast yet because it hasn't come up. But Hope's character straight up died. And, and you revived her. My cleric had to had to use Revivify for the first time. Yeah. I think that, well, it came up at some point. I don't know if it came up on the episode that actually aired or not. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Since we had to re-record that one. But uh, anyway, but in the last session, we accidentally stumbled into some vampires. Should have killed us. Should have killed us. They rolled really bad. But I don't know if if Sarah fudged any rolls. I don't know. Maybe she was having mm. mercy on us. Mm. Um, Vampires, I think, are another bad guy that you can get away with not having a lot of remorse for. I think it depends on... You can spin it 
with vampires, I think you can spin it a bunch of different directions. Mm-hmm. If they're like Buffy, I'm like Dracula, no, no, like Dracula vampires. Well, I mean, in Buffy, they're like demons that possess a, a dead body. Yeah. So, like, right. I think you can get away with that. And and Dracula, you know, Dracula's mm-hmm. pretty uh, bad. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, but then, you know, you've got your Twilights. They, no, they don't count. <laughs> They're not real vampires. No, no. Um, anyway, that that's pretty much it for my playing. But now, now that I've beat Tears of the Kingdom, I can take a little break. I do want to go back and, like, beat all the shrines and do all the side quests. Um, but... I'm going to take a little little break and I'm going to spend a lot of time in Baldur's Gate 3. Very exciting. <laughs> so yeah, that's what awesome. that's what I've been up to. Nice. Mm-hmm. Good time. Good time. For sure. So, um, tune in next week for the next episode of the Read Along. Yes. For a magic steep in poison. Yes, indeed. Uh, so, I guess until next time, happy reading. And we'll talk to you next time. Later.